in uh, Romans chapter 12 will be my text and then I will just give you some scriptures about faith because I think I meet a lot of people and they talk faith but their faith is not saving faith and I don't want that to be so with you now we all have faith all of us have faith you, you believe that the clothes you're wearing are going to keep you warm you believe the chair you're sitting on is going to hold you you believe the meal that you eat is going to sustain you that's faith but that's not saving faith so we all have faith Romans chapter 12 verse 1 Paul is the apostle writing this to the Roman church I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for this I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt with each one of us according to the measure of faith for as we have many members in one body but all members do not do the same functions so we have many members are one body in Christ and individual members of one another having then differing gifts according to the grace that is given to us let us use them if prophesied prophecy let us prophecy in proportion to our faith or ministry let us use it in our ministry he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And the Lord will add his blessing to the hearing of the word of God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart one believes and with the mouth one confesses some of you i meet so many people who confess they're christians but their lifestyle says they're not christians at all if you're living a lifestyle contrary to that which god has called you to live you don't have faith in christ if you have faith in christ part of faith means you believe in him you trust in him and you adhere to what he says you obey him a lot of people, I've even had people say, well, I don't like that part of the Bible. <laughs> well, it's all one, you know. Or I don't like that guy in church. So, well, guess what? That, you're stuck with him. We're all one body. That's like my toe saying to my thumb, I don't like you. Well, it don't make any difference. We're part of the package. We've got to have faith. Responding, now here, responding to the moral light and conviction of the Holy Spirit an awakened sinner turns from all known sin and experiences repentance towards God. When you come to Christ, you see yourself, you know your sin, God knows your sin, and you change direction. That's saving faith. When you change directions, you repent. The word repent means you change directions. I was going this way, I stop, I do a total 180, and I start going another way. You can't say you have faith if you just keep walking that sinful road. You don't have faith. You have hope, but your hope is going to leave you short. Because if you die in that state, you did not have saving faith. Guys, we're talking about God. We're talking about Yahweh. The supreme being of all the universes and all the galaxies. And he has laid away for mankind. How in the world do we think we can say, I don't like that part of God or question God. How who are we to question God? And people will say, well, but I don't know if I, listen, you do believe. You all believe. I met a guy one time told me he was an atheist. He said, I don't believe in God. I said, I don't believe in atheism. If you were dying, if you were on your deathbed, if you were in a foxhole, you'd be praying. I've gotten on airplanes before. I heard uh, a man of God do this. I've done it before too. You get on an airplane and you pray for bad weather. Because all these machos and these guys who were flirting with the stewardesses a few minutes ago, all of a sudden they bring out their little Bibles or New Testament that they have hidden for emergencies of their rosaries. And then they start praying. So I get a chance to talk to them about Jesus. I shared the Lord coming home from the army. 
uh, not from the army, I wasn't in the army yet. I was coming home from Tampa, shared the Lord with this guy uh, coming in Omaha. We were in bad storm. It was a perfect opportunity for me to share the Lord with him. I have to tell you, on the way to Florida, God gave me an amazing vision. I don't like to fly. I'm not afraid to fly. If I die, I go to heaven. I don't like to fly because it blows up my ears. And so I don't like that. So you know, you chew gum, you blow your pop your ears a thousand times. But I was I was listening to the Bible on 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 a, in those days a Walkman, and uh, I was kind of belly aching my spirit. Well, I hate having to go. I didn't want to go. It was for Jock, you know. And then afterwards, the Lord just really told me, "I am sending you here." And when I looked outside, if you've flown, you get above the clouds, how beautiful it is. It can be stormy down here. You get up here, it's beautiful. The clouds are brilliant. And I, I, I had a vision, a huge vision of Jesus sitting on his throne with a scepter in his hand. I mean, he is enormous. I can't describe it. I've seen Jesus on a number of occasions. I've never seen his face. And then on the way back, I get that chance to share the Lord with somebody. Guys, God is God. And the message that we have here is the message people need to hear. I'm looking at Roxanne, and I remember doing a funeral for a little sweet baby, five-year-old Angel. And I remember Angel had had, uh, what was it, the meningitis when he was a baby, and it, it, it damaged him. So for five years, he was just really a very simple but beautiful child. And I told that congregation, the people who came to that funeral, I said, you know what? You have seen Jesus in this little boy for five years that we've had him on the earth. Because the angel didn't hate anyone because of the color of his skin. Angel didn't hate anyone because of where they went to church. Angel just loved people. See, God's love, that's real faith. He was as precious as he can be. So I want to give you a couple things that are not faith and what are faith. This is not saving faith. It's not a mental assent, a professed belief in the gospel of fact in the Bible. It's not because you say, oh, I believe it up here. Because if you don't, if you don't believe it down here, you don't, it's not happening down here. There's a disconnect between here and here. And this 18 inches of circumference on the top of your necks are going to keep a lot of people out of heaven. Because you can't figure it out. You can't believe it down here. You've got to let that in. You've got to believe in here. Sam told me he watched God's Not Dead last night. Any of you guys ever seen that movie? God's Not Dead? Great movie. Said he first time he cried in years. You know what? It's an awesome story. God is not dead, but the world today that we live in treats him like he is. This is not saving faith, to believe that one is saved or believe the results before the actual event. So I know people say, well, I'm saved. I knew a guy who used to come to my Bible studies very long ago. This guy said that he gave himself to Jesus back when he was a teenager, 12 years old. Then when he was in then when he was in Vietnam, he was going into the brothels in Vietnam and hooking up with the prostitutes, doing all these terrible things. And he said, Well, but I was saved. No, you weren't saved. You were not saved. You weren't walking with the Lord. Listen, you can say you're saved up here all you want. Remember something. There is a million roads to hell. There's a million ways to get there. There's not one way out. You can get to hell really easy, but you can't ever get out once you're in there. I can tell you I don't want to be the one to keep someone from hearing this word. Be still. Be still. There are a million ways to hell, and there's no way out once you're in there. But there's one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Saving faith, it, saving faith is not self-energized, strenuous effort. You know, there are people out there just to try to do good, do good, do good, do good, do good, do good. I'm going to earn my way to heaven. That's not faith. That's works. Faith is saying, when the Bible says Jesus is the only way, and you realize he is the only way, and you put all your eggs in that basket. Some of us, we try to have a couple of eggs over here, a couple of eggs over here, a couple of eggs over here. All my eggs are in one basket. And it's the, it's the Jesus basket. And it's going to take me into the kingdom of heaven as soon as I leave this earth. And if today the, the Lord should choose to come and there was a great trumpet blast, I'm going to heaven. 
Those in Christ are going to rise and go and meet the Lord in the air. I have faith that I believe that. I don't just hope it with my fingers crossed, that kind of nonsense. I know it. It's just as soon as I'm looking at you, I know that Jesus is going to come. And if he comes while I'm alive, I'm going to meet him together with, he, with the rest of the saints in the air. If he comes after I'm asleep, then my body will rise up and meet him then. Hallelujah. Saving faith. Saving faith to believe. To believe a person or a statement made by a person to be true, to be persuaded of, to the credit or place confidence in, to rely upon something or someone as stable and trustworthy, to trust in or commit one's life. Mark chapter 1 verse 15, and I'm supposed to use, somebody asked me today, what was my favorite verse of the Bible? I can't say I have a favorite verse of the Bible, but I do have a verse that I believe is the verse that Father gave me for my life, and it's John chapter 14 verse 12. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than me shall he do, because I go to the Father. That is a scripture that I, I just place my life upon. I believe it with all my heart. Now, Mark chapter 1, verse 15 says, The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. That means if you're living in a sinful lifestyle right now, then what does that mean? That means anything that God cannot bless, anything God does not condone. If you're living in a lifestyle that God does not bless, that God does not agree with, you are in sin. There's a difference between sin and being in sin. We can sin by, by gossiping or being hateful or having prejudice or something. That's sin. But to be in sin is to choose to be in a lifestyle that you know offends the holy God. That is to be in sin. To be in relationships. I was telling somebody the other day came to see me. And I've had men come to share with me before that they've fallen into sin. Sexual sin. And every time I would say to her, let me ask you a question. Have you been reading your Bible? Have you been spending your quiet time with God? Never course they have it. They get away from God, they stop feeding on the Word of God, and then they become vulnerable and the enemy attacks. That's because we need to every day eat the Word of God. Going back into Mark, actually let's go to John 15, 3, 15, 16. John, you guys know this, I don't even have to look it up. John 3, 15 and 16. So be 14 first. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. What does that come from? When the children of Israel had been let go, when God got them out of Egypt, they were in the desert, heading for the promised land, and they were grumbling and constantly fighting against Moses and complaining, my goodness, God had fed them with manna, he gave them quails, everything they needed, he gave them, but they still belly, just like we do today. And God got so upset with them at one point, he allowed these servants to be loosed in the camp of Israel. And everyone, people were being bit by these snakes, and they were dying, and they were panicking, and they came to Moses, and God told him to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. And he said to tell them, everyone who looks upon that serpent will not die, will be healed. So Jesus is saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man might be lifted up, must be lifted up on the cross. And everyone who looks to Jesus, and it's not just looking at Jesus, it's looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's looking to Jesus with faith and saying, Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Help me. Here I am. I'm drowning in my own sin. I'm drowning in my own filth. I'm drowning. Please save me, Lord. Save me. And Jesus will move on that prayer. Jesus says here in 15 and comes to 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise the Lord. He made a way for it. I believe that. I trust in that to be my, my foundation of life. John's Gospel, chapter 7. 
I've preached this just from this text right here many times. John chapter 7, verses 37. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted, and he said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, as the scripture says. Anyone who believes in me, as the scripture says. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from your heart. When he had said this, he was speaking living water, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit who was to be given on everyone believing in him. But the Spirit at this point had not yet been given. When you have saving faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to come into your life and change you. He changes the way that you think. He changes the way that you communicate with God. He changes the way that you interact with people. He changes your desires. He changes your hope. He changes everything. He can change you to, from a, a hater to a lover. He can change you from a sinner to a saint. He can change you from someone who absolutely... I was telling Juana today uh, about a woman named Carla Faye Tucker. I saw this years ago. Carla Faye Tucker was... I think it was Texas. You'll have to check me on that. But she... When she was eight or nine years old, her mother was a drug addict and she caught her hands on heroin, cocaine, anything she wanted at that age. She was doing hard drugs at that young age. And by the time I think she was 15 or 16... She and this fellow she was running around with got ripped off in a drug deal and they were just loaded out of their minds. They went to the drug dealer's house and they killed him with pickaxes. They absolutely destroyed this guy. And when the cops came and arrested her, I mean, I saw a picture of her. She was so full of the devil. And while she was in waiting for trial, somebody in the jail ministry led her to Jesus. I mean, she believed. I mean, she had faith. And so she goes to court, the whole night, the girl sitting there in court being charged. It's not the same girl who wielded the, the pickaxe. And they put her on death row. And for years she was on death row down there. And she led people to Jesus. People before they were put to death. Just people, even the guards. When her time came up, when her number came up for her to be put to death, the family of the victim the prosecuting attorneys petitioned the governor to give her a state of execution because they had heard about her. They had corresponded with her. She was totally, totally changed. Only God can do that. They did end up putting her to death and she had absolutely no fear whatsoever of going to be with Jesus. I thought it was a shame because she touched so many lives, but it was her time. But that's the kind of saving faith Jesus is talking about here. He that believes in me shall not die. You'll be changed. The Bible tells us when anyone's in Christ Jesus, they become a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become like new. So you could be one thing and God can change you to something totally different. Right. You, Many of you in this room are, are living examples, living epistles of what Christ can do in a life. Yesterday, there's a guy who works for me. He's he's a hard one to talk to. He's got a little bit of Asperger's, but uh, I tried to share the Lord with him quite a bit. But boy, you were in there. He left. I said, well, that fellow was a nice guy, wasn't he? Yeah, he really was a nice guy. I said, let me tell you a little bit. I told him a little bit about your past. And his mouth was dropping. <laughs> really? I said, yes. See, people don't understand. God can change your life. Thank you, Lord. He can change your life. He can give you an absolute, but it takes faith. 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 Believe, firm persuasion, or conviction of the truth of anything. Generally leaning the entire personality upon God or Christ in absolute trust. Your entire life needs to trust in Christ. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. I mean, what I say, put all your eggs in that basket. Jesus is my all in all. He's everything. He has to become everything. He can't be just part of your life. Some people compartmentalize, well, I have my business life, I have my home life, I have my private life, I have my public life. No. The child of God has only one life. And it doesn't even belong to him. It belongs to Jesus. Acts chapter 15, 
59. Hello? He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. He was saying, God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles, and he does not confess. So if you, if you come to Jesus, you could have been raised a completely different person. You could have been raised without God in whatsoever. You could have been raised in a, in a Muslim house. You could be in so many things. But when you come to Jesus, God doesn't look at that past. All he sees is the new. He forgave the past, and he gives us the new. That's the awesome thing about God, what he's done for you. Some of you guys in this room, you're, you struggle with your past sins. You, you struggle with your past sins. You can't forgive yourself for some of the things you do. But let me say this. On the cross, and I, I can't read all those to you. There's no way I could put every sin that the world has done. But whatever that sin is that you can't forgive yourself for, it's on the cross. And the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Your sins are forgiven. You need to accept that and move on. I know a guy I've been working with for years. I keep telling him, you've got to forgive yourself. Well, I can't. Well, then, so you're calling God a liar? No, I wouldn't do that. Well, Jesus says that I'll cast your sin as far as Jesus is from the west, and I'll remember them no more. Then how can you, if God can forgive you, how come you can't forgive them? Are you greater than God? Accept what God has done for you and live a new life. Accept what God has done for you and live a new life. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Did I hear a little amen? Yeah. So, no, I thought the little sweetheart said that. Oh. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Romans chapter 3. Listen here. Verses 23. I'm going to For everyone has sinned. And has fallen short of God's standards, his glories. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every one of us needs a Savior. Nobody has ever been born into this world except for Jesus Christ himself, who did not need a Savior. That means Mother Teresa, in all her goodness, and all the wonderful things she did, she needed a Savior. Mother Mary herself said, look how God, my Savior, Mary, the mother of Jesus, called God her Savior. Mary needed a Savior. We all need a Savior. There was only one who was born without sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, yet God, with, under, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sins. For God had presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back. Yes. I would, when I read that, I always stop and say, that's not really being fair. Not fair to him, not fair to Jesus. Extremely fair to us. This fact, uh, sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them into what he would do in the present time. In other words, people like Abraham people in the Old Testament that didn't have a Savior yet, God held their faith and it was accounted to them also as righteousness. People, if you have saving faith, if you can say, God, I believe you. I believe you. I trust in you. I want to live my life the way you want me to live. You will be saved and you will be changed. And anybody who says that they're, they're unchanged, I have to think you have not had an encounter yet with Jesus. God took me from a, a heart that wanted drugs, of course. I loved drugs. I, was, I loved cocaine. I loved, I didn't even know about meth until I ran out of cocaine and somebody gave me some meth. And man, I, I really loved that. Smoked dope every day. I thought I had it all figured out. I was going to be this big shot in this company I was working for. I was being groomed to be the young hot shop car, the youngest general manager of one of their hotels. And I was empty and I was broken. And when I gave my life to Jesus, I wasn't the same. Though. I did not have a desire for any of that. No. Zero desire for it. I didn't have any. I didn't go to AA. I didn't go to Al-Anon. I didn't do I'm not knocking it. But that's not how it worked for me. He delivered me. And I didn't need any. I didn't want it anymore. Because he changed my life. And I believed it. 
I mean, it's amazing to me. It's not like I can say, well, I have such great faith. No. I mean, I just woke up and I was different. And then you realize, how could that happen? Only God can do that. And so I believe it. So when I see people struggling with the same things I used to struggle with, I can say with all faith, God can take that away from you. The question is, do you want him to? He's not going to work against you. You have to work with him. But have faith. Have faith. Have faith. I'm going to give you just one or two more and I'll leave you alone. To receive oneself. To take or join oneself. Admit, acknowledge, receive something transmitted. To receive with the mind properly and take it to one side. In other words, embrace it totally again. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is a total lifestyle. Faith, faith tells you who I am. If you were to ask, if someone were asked to describe you and write down what they know about you, I would hope it would be faith. Believe in Christ. Believe in God. When I'm gone, I hope that they just know me, that they would say, this guy really believed in God. He loved the Lord. He was a man of God. John's Gospel, chapter 111, says, He came to his own people, and yet they rejected him. Jesus is coming to you today. Every Sunday, some of you guys come in here. Jesus is coming to you today, and you reject him. He came as a man, and mankind has rejected Jesus. And some of you are rejecting Jesus week after week, rolling around, playing around, not paying attention, just can't wait for me to get done because you want to go get some groceries or you want to do this. Guys, I'm telling you, the clock is ticking of your life. Every heartbeat that you beat is one less heartbeat that you will have. Every heartbeat. And we fiddle around and Jesus is saying, look what I did for you. Look what I did for you. I made a way where there was no way. What are you going to do about it? And that top clock keeps ticking, 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 ticking. There's going to be a place in hell, I'm afraid, where there are going to be souls of those who thought they had more time. And they didn't. It was too late. I don't want that to happen to you. And if it does, and I say this with, with love, the blood's not going to be on my hands. I'm going to tell this thing just like it is. If it's heavy, it's heavy. If it's tight, but it's right. You've got to make a choice. The time is short. You've got that precious little baby and these precious little kids over here. Do you know what your responsibility to teach those children about the Lord? It's our responsibility to raise up our children. My wife gets the credit in my family. My girls, when I was raised, you know, we, we were just a bunch of wild kids. My parents were just 10 children in the family, so we'd fill a whole pew, you know. And while the kids are being good, the ones closest to mom and dad were being good, and I'd be down there fiddling around making racket. And I'd get an elbow in the ribs, and I'd take a look down my head, and then they'd be on my desk, and then all of a sudden, my head would I did. But when my kids were being raised, Amanda came right after I was saved. So I got saved in 85, she was born in 86. So they, they only know this dad. And I still say to this day, and they still do to this day, when they are sick, they would come up to me and say, Daddy, I am sick. Will you please pray for me? Daddy, my head hurts. Will you pray for me? Daddy, I have a fever. Will you pray for me? When they were little girls, they learned that there's power in prayer. They never asked me for an aspirin. And still to this day, when they're sick, Dad, will you pray for me? Dad, will you pray for me? I have them pray for me too. They believe it. They believe it. They've seen it. One time, I was just thinking the other day when we were coming back from Iowa City, I don't know, many might have been five, four or five, and we hit this terrible storm. And I'm driving a big U-Haul uh, tow on this car we had in those days. And it was so bad, we pulled up underneath a uh, overpass. I've never done that before. And I said, boy, this is a terrible storm. And little, little man, he says, well, let's pray about it, Dad. And so we prayed about it. You know what? Storm stopped. Passed away. Bam. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, the eyes protect the praise. Let's learn from our children, but we need to train them in the ways of God. We need to teach them the ways of God. John 14. 
Babies are so precious. John 14, 3. I'm going to go back up to one. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. So he's saying to us, don't be afraid. I use this scripture a lot of times at a funeral. Do you believe in God? Now believe in me, Jesus says. In my father's house are many mansions. If I were not so, I would have told you so. But I go to prepare a place for you, he said. Do you realize that when you trust Jesus, he has prepared a place just for you? I seem to think that perhaps the room is going to be so for us, it would be a place where you can only say, wow, everything I love, everything, this is home for me. Because he knows us so well. Guys, I want you to have real faith. I want you to trust and be persuaded. I want you to learn to obey God. If you trust God, you need to obey him. You need to obey him. Because if you don't obey him, the Bible says, if you love me, Jesus said, then keep my commandments. Well, what's the other side of that shoe? If you don't love me, you won't keep my commandments. What are my commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. The Ten Commandments. Look, there's more. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't hate, but love. Give somebody cold water when they're thirsty. Feed somebody when they're hungry. Go to somebody when they're when they're when they're in the hospital or in prison. When they're naked, give them some clothes. Take care of people. I would do it if I were there. And since I'm up with God, I'm going to have you do it for me. And I'm even going to give you the spirit, my spirit, to cause it all to happen just the way I want it to. How's your leg feeling, Sam? We pray for that leg. Total healing. No more pain. I want you guys to know that there's a difference between false faith and saving faith. Some people believe that if you go to a church and light certain candles and say prayers, your prayers are going to be heard. That's nonsense. So I can have all this sin in my heart and go light a few candles. Do you think God's impressed with candles? Come on. What God, what draws God is obedience. It's love. It's saying, yes, Father, I'm going to live my life for you. You died for me, Lord Jesus, so I'm going to live for you. That's what faith is all about. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe it with all my heart. I believe he was put in the tomb, and three days later he rose again from the dead. I believe 40 days after that he ascended to the power. And I believe on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came on the church. And I believe the Holy Spirit comes into the life of every true believer in Christ Jesus to equip them and empower them to do extraordinary things for his name's sake. I believe God can change a man's heart. I believe God can change a woman's heart. And that's how I live my life. That's why God blesses. He doesn't bless me because I'm perfect. He blesses me because I believe Him. I'm a long way from perfect. But I believe Him. I believe every word in this Bible. Do you? You can't take some and leave some. You can't. It's all or nothing. So I encourage you today to have saving faith in Jesus Christ. To come to Christ with your mind. Come to Christ with your heart. Come to Christ with your, your whole body, soul, and spirit. And say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that if I come to you today and believe in you, to be who the Bible says you are, that I will be changed, I will be transformed, and I will be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Jesus can take someone who can't speak and be a public speaker. I met a girl, well, girl, I met a woman uh, from the Sudan. She was a woman of God. She was so old, they didn't even know how old she was. Her family didn't know how old she was. Her, her parent or her, her daughters meant to mock 
You know the Bach. Some of you guys know the Bach family. Godly people. And when I had heard that Bebda's mom had come to Omaha, I felt in my spirit God was saying to me, you need to go meet this woman. And so I was at work, but you know, if you've had God pull on your heart, you know, you got to go. He was telling me, go now. So I called Pastor Mark and said, I really need to come and meet your mother-in-law. So I get there that day, and mom was in the back room. I mean, she's close to 100 if she was, if she was a day. But she was in the back room, and there was a chair sitting in the middle of the floor. And when I got there, Bentley didn't know I called. She said, the Lord told her today, her mother, that he was going to send a man of God today, and he was going to sit in this chair, and she was going to pray at my feet. I was so humbled. I thought, my goodness. And so I walk in there. Here's the chair, and here's this beautiful old woman asking God to bless me like that. I was so moved by it. She called me her little Toto, which in their language means her little child. I've been so blessed with godly people in my life. But I say that because God told the woman I was coming. She had faith. She put the chair in there. He told me to go. I had faith, and I went. And we had this amazing experience together, and we became dear friends. I preached her funeral, as a matter of fact. Guys, it's a whole other life out there that God's offering you. He's offering you a whole other life with a whole new, a new family, a whole new everything. <laughs> I'm telling you, I can tell you those stories. We'll be here till two weeks from Thursday. He's awesome. He's real, and he loves you. But you have to come by faith. You have to come by faith. You repeat this prayer after me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the church. And I believe in the blood of Christ that can cleanse me, wash me, and make me new. I want to live my life by this declaration of faith. I want to lay hands on the sick and the sick be recovered. I want to preach the word of God under the power of the Holy Spirit and see lives changed, blind eyes open, deaf ears hear, cancers falling off bodies, dead raised to life. It's in the Bible. I believe it. In Jesus' name. Now, there are people in this room who are not saved today. You don't have saving faith. I'm telling you.